Hey everyone. So um, in this next lecture, we're going to dive into uh, linear models as a kind of a jumping off point for thinking about more complex uh, models that we're going to build on progressively throughout the, the rest of the semester. And particularly, uh, what I want to do is, is kind of frame this around the uh, assumptions of linear regressions and thinking about how we can relax these assumptions. Uh, also point out there's a, there's a few slides here uh, that are at the beginning of this slide deck that I'm going to basically just jump over at this point uh, in order to dive into the assumptions of the linear model. They're there for, for reference to kind of dive into the math, but they talk a bit about reminding us what linear models are and how they include things like ANOVAs, recalling us, reminding us of the analytical solutions that we've covered already for linear models, uh, going through um, some of the concepts we learned in the previous sections uh, on uncertainty, showing that we can come up with uh, analytical estimates of the uncertainties in our intercept and our inter uncertainties in our slope based on Fisher information. Uh, and then kind of showing that we can do the maximum likelihood equivalent of derivation of multiple regression, uh, and that that ends up giving us a solution uh, that is, is very comparable to what we got in our Bayesian der derivation of uh, the um, slope and, and variance estimates. Okay. Um, but you know, in the interest of time, I didn't want to really dive into the gory details of that math because I really want to jump into what I think is more interesting and important here, the assumptions of linear models. So here I've outlined uh, six key bullet points that are key assumptions built into linear, standard linear models. Uh, first is the assumption of homoscedasticity. This is the assumption of uh, that, that the variance is constant, that, you know, for every observed data point, say on the x-axis, you know, the, we make a prediction for the y and, and the, the sigma for each of those predictions is the same for, for every point. Uh, classic linear regression also assumes that, there, that the error is on the y, uh, and there's not error uh, in the x variables, that there's only error in the y. Uh, we assume also that the, that error in the y variables is just observation error. It's just measurement error. It's not errors in the process itself. You know, it's based on the idea that, the, the, you know, we're writing down the right model uh, and there's not uncertainty in the model, but we're just seeing uncertainty in the, in the data. Uh, I think as we, we've talked about in the past, uh, um, there's an assumption that the error is normally distributed. Uh, there's also this assumption that observations are independent. We've talked about that since the very beginning uh, as something that will eventually relax when we get to spatial models and time series models. Uh, and also the assumption that there is no missing data. So before I dive into uh, the details of these different assumptions of, of linear models and how to relax them, I wanted to take a minute to introduce this idea of graphical notation, which we'll uh, be using uh, throughout the rest of the semester to kind of help us understand uh, what models are doing in a way that kind of focuses on the relationships among parameters and data sets rather than getting bogged down into the details of what the process model and data model actually are. Uh, and noting that this can often help us understand the structure of our model and help us in writing down our conditional distributions, for example, if we're doing Gibbs sampling. Um, so if we think about something as simple as fitting uh, a mean to a data set X, I was, you know, putting some mean and variance, where we just have uh, the prior and the mean, the prior and the variance. We can notate this graphically as saying, in our data model, we just have X, our data. Our process model is just the mean and the variance. And our parameter model, in this stage, just describes the priors, the prior parameters uh, that inform uh, that mu and sigma. So if we think about a slightly more complicated model or a linear regression model, um, we now have within the data model stage that X informs Y uh, and that also the regression parameters beta 
in this uh, residual error sigma both also inform y. So the process model stage is focusing on the param parameters in our process model, the beta and the sigma. Um, and then our parameter model stage focuses on the priors on those parameters. So the first assumption that I wanted to talk about in uh, classic linear models is the assumption of constant variance known as homoscedasticity. So scedasticity refers to uh, variance or variability. Homoscedasticity would mean you know, the same variance everywhere. The violation of that being uh, heteroscedasticity. So the variance is, is changing. Uh, so if we look at these two data sets, the one on the left shows uh, an example of a linear model that meets this classic assumption of constant variance. You know, we look at the residuals around this line, we can see that, they, that the variability is, is the same uh, across, uh, regardless of the value of x. Uh, by contrast, if we look at the second data set on the right, as x changes, we can see that the variability changes as well. So for low values of x, we see very little variability in the data. <clears throat> and at high values of x, we see quite a bit of variability around the data. So we are uh, clearly violating the assumption that the, the variance is constant. It seems to be increasing as a function of x in this particular case. So how do we deal with, with heteroscedasticity? Uh, there's two solutions that are commonly used. Uh, the one that I think is, is often taught at a more introductory level is the idea of transforming our data. Uh, one advantage of tr transforming our data to try to make the variance equal uh, is that you don't have an addition of additional parameters, uh, but the, the negative of this is that we're not actually modeling the original data, we're now modeling some transformation of that. So our, our likelihood will have a different meaning, our process model will have a different meaning, um, and often a way that's unintuitive. You know, I might be able to think about, you know, how, you know, my response variable y changes the function of x, but I might not have an intuitive feeling for how the, you know, square root or arctangent or, you know, any of these other weird transforms of that, you know, changes the function of x. Um, it's not often, you know, it's something that, people deal with, but it's not something where it, you know, it actually in many ways changes your, the meaning of your process model. The other thing to remember when transforming data is that back transformations can be non-trivial because of the violation of Jensen's inequality. Uh, you have to be very careful with that. And that said, we've discussed in the past uh, how things like the propagating error through Monte Carlo methods help us um, address that, that back transformation. Um, the alternative to uh, transform our data is to change our model such that we are actually explicitly modeling the variance. Uh, the advantage of this is that we are now continue to work with our original data, original model. There's no need for transformations. There's no violations of Jensen's inequality. Uh, the, the cost of this is that we have to add an additional process model that describes how our variability is changing, which will mean that we've added parameters and in a Bayesian sense we've added priors. So one simple example of this might be uh, here, uh, instead of assuming that my variance uh, was just some constant sigma squared, I've now made that variance a, a linear model, actually I've made the standard deviation a linear model of x. So uh, there's some you know, intercept, which is you know, the, the standard deviation uh, when x equals zero, and then some slope that describes how um, that standard deviation is increasing as x is increasing. And so in this model, we would have, we'd still have our, our x related to y and betas, but we also now have uh, this set of alphas, which are this intercept and slope in this model on the standard deviation, and then priors on each of those. This slide illustrates uh, an example of how we might actually implement a heteroscedastic model, uh, both for uh, a maximum likelihood variant done in R and a Bayesian model done in JAGS. Uh, 
Uh, and this is really to make the point that this relaxation of assumptions, this changing to putting a process model on uh, the uncertainty itself actually doesn't include, doesn't require a, a, a massive change in model structure. So if we look at the maximum likelihood version, uh, in black is what we would have had originally if we'd written down a, a maximum likelihood version model for a linear regression. So we have we pass in a vector of parameters, we pull out the betas from there, we plug those betas into our prediction of the expected value of x, the mean. Uh, now we're also pulling out these alphas instead of what we previously had, which was just pulling out a sigma. And instead of having this single constant sigma for all x's, we now have this linear model for x's. Uh, beyond this, you know, we've, we've moved our uncertainty from, you know, we've moved our model from being three parameters, two betas and a sigma, to being uh, four parameters, uh, two betas and two alphas, so a, you know, a slight increase in complexity. But everything else we would do would be the same. You know, when we, to use this model, we'd need an initial guess for theta, and then we'd put it into a, a numerical optimization, same as before. Uh, the Bayesian version of this is very similar. Um, you know, um, one notable difference is that because we have these two parameters alpha, uh, we now have to specify priors on those. So I've now put uh, fairly uninformative priors on those. And, and you'll note that I actually put a log normal prior on the, these two alphas. And that was actually because like how we had a, a gamma precision prior in the precision because the precision could not be negative. Uh, we cannot let um, this linear model, this uh, alpha one plus alpha two x, predict a negative standard deviation or negative precision. So by assuming uh, long normal um, priors or any prior that enforces that uh, alpha one and alpha two cannot be negative, uh, we're enforcing that we're not going to uh, predict um, negative values um, for uh, for the the variance. Okay, so now we've got that the prior in there. Now we have to have down here this calculation of the precision. So remember that we are writing down our linear model for the standard deviation. Uh, to get that to precision, we now have to square that uh, and then take the, uh, one over that uh, to, to turn it from a variance into a precision. The other thing we'll note in the model here is now we have our mu, uh, we've always had our mu indexed by i because each different x has a different prediction of the mu, uh, but we also now have the precision indexed by i because each different x has its own uh, prediction for what the uh, precision is. If we look at uh, what we get out from f fitting these models to data, here again are these two data sets, one that appears to be homoscedastic and the other one that appears to be heteroscedastic. If we fit these models in a maximum likelihood context, so this AIC home is fitting our standard regression model where the variance is homoscedastic and the AIC het is fitting uh, the model where um, the variance is heteroscedastic. Uh, we'll see that if we look at the the prediction of the mean and the interval estimates, that these are, are essentially uh, identical. You know, when there is not, um, when the variance itself is not actually changing through time, the model correctly identifies that it's not changing in time, and we get the same fit. Um, but we get it at a, at a penalty. We can see that the AIC uh, in the heteroscedastic version is, is approximately too larger than the AIC in the homoscedastic, and that's because uh, you know, the residual error is going to be the same, so the, the log likelihood is going to be the same, uh, but you have this penalty for this additional parameter, and that, that you have an additional parameter that's penalizing you for additional complexity when you're not actually uh, explaining anything else. So the AIC would s support the homoscedastic model here. If we come and look at the heteroscedastic model, we see something very, very different. Uh, First, if we look at the AIC, we see that there's a, a strong support uh, for the um, heteroscedastic model over the homoscedastic, even though the 
process model, the linear process model is identical. If we look at the graph, we can actually see that the, the predictions of the mean, so the, the homoscedastic is the red line and the, and the heteroscedastic is the green line, we see the predictions of the mean of the model are very, very similar. That, um, that the heteroscedasticity in the data does not actually change the prediction of the mean very much. And in fact, that very point is sometimes used in introductory classes to, to note that the linear model is itself very resilient to the assumption of constant variance, that you will actually get very similar parameter estimates when you violate that assumption. Uh, but where you see a much more dramatic effect is on the interval estimates, that even though um, your estimate of the mean didn't change very much, your estimates of your uncertainty are, are very different. So the heteroastic model is correctly identifying that there's much, very little variability when x is low and very high variability when x is high. Um, so maybe if you were only interested in the mean, you wouldn't necessarily see much difference. But if you were making predictions, you know, the at low x, the homoscedastic model would be predicting much more variability than you're actually likely to see in the real world. And at high x, the homoscedastic model or traditional regression model would be predicting much less variability than we were actually seeing in the system. So, you know, our ability to make predictions would be very different between these two scenarios. You know, uh, by not modeling the variance explicitly, uh, we would be misrepresenting the confidence that we should have uh, in our predictions. In the Bayesian version, I you know, repeated the same calculations using DIC, and we can see uh, very similar results. So the DICs are very similar between the homoscedastic and heteroscedastic when there is no change in variance. And we see a, you know, a penalty of, to the heteroscedastic for including that additional parameter that's not needed. By contrast, in the heteroscedastic model, we see that the, mo that the model you know, supports, uh, our model selection criteria supports that additional complexity. Uh, and again, you know, captures this difference in variability uh, depending on x. A few additional thoughts on how we model variance. So here we made the assumption that the um, standard deviation changed linearly as a function of x, but you know, like with the process model on x, the process model on sigma does not need to be linear. You could have had it been nonlinear uh, in, in various forms. Uh, you could have written down that model in terms of the standard deviation, which we did here, or you could write down a model for the variance or the precision. Uh, we can also make um, our, our variance change not just with uh, continuous variables like x, but we could also have our variance change with treatments or factors or other categorical variables. Uh, and in that way, it kind of lets us relax that classic ANOVA assumption of equal variance among treatments. So we could actually model that the variance might be different between different treatments rather than uh, just assuming that it's constant. Uh, we could also set things up where uh, our variance isn't necessarily a function of our x data or our treatments, uh, but we could also set it up such that it could be driven by uh, different variables. So maybe our prediction of the mean is driven by an x, but our prediction of the variance could change depending on you know, the measurement technique or the sensor or the individual that made the observation. So you could write down a different set of covariance on your, uh, how your variance is changing than the covariance that you use to predict how your, your mean is changing. 